The case of Mary Alice Poltz, whose remains were discovered in a shallow grave in Crescent Beach in 1985, has finally seen a breakthrough nearly four decades later. The St. John's County Sheriff's Office, through persistent efforts and advancements in DNA technology, identified her remains in January 2024. Mary Alice Poltz, born in 1943 and raised in Maryland, disappeared after leaving with her boyfriend, John Thomas Fugit, in 1968. The circumstances of her disappearance remained a mystery until the recent identification of her remains. Authorities found evidence suggesting Poltz underwent brain surgery after 1968, indicating she was involved in a traumatic event requiring hospitalization, possibly a vehicle crash or being struck by a vehicle. John Thomas Fugit, also known as Billy Joe Wallace, remains a person of interest in the case. He was sentenced to death in Georgia for a 1981 murder and died in prison before his execution. The sheriff's office emphasized its commitment to the investigation, urging anyone with information to come forward. The use of advanced DNA technology, combined with the dedication of skilled detectives, underscores the sheriff's office's determination to seek justice for victims and closure for their families. St. John's County Sheriff's Office is still actively investigating the homicide. Anyone with information relating to the case is asked to email crime tips at sjso.org or to call Crime Stoppers at 1 888 277 TIPS 8477. A murder suspect, identified as Karen Fisher, age 20, has been charged in connection with a disturbing incident captured on video. The event, which occurred around 7 50 p.m. on May 3rd, involved Fisher allegedly running over a man twice with a car, followed by a sequence of violence, including a fatal stabbing. Despite being described as a man in court documents, Fisher is referred to as she by the Houston Police Department. The victim, 64-year-old Stephen Anderson, was reportedly on his way to collect his mail when the attack took place. Video footage from a neighbor appears to depict a deliberate assault, showing Anderson being struck by a white car, reversing to hit him again, and then Fisher emerging in all-black attire with a knife. Fisher is shown flipping Anderson over, kissing him, and subsequently stabbing him nine times before attempting to flee in another vehicle, ultimately escaping after jumping over the victim's body. Upon police arrival at the scene, Anderson was discovered deceased with multiple stab wounds. Witnesses led officers to Fisher, who was detained and questioned before being formally charged and transported to the Harris County Jail. Reports indicate that there is no known relationship between Fisher and the victim. Fisher was previously under community supervision for evading arrest in 2023 and had a prior charge of prostitution in 2021, which was dismissed. Fisher's next court appearance is scheduled for May 24th, with a bond set at $2.125 million, according to online jail records. Mm -hmm. New attorneys for convicted killer Scott Peterson are going back to a San Mateo County courtroom today. His case has been picked up by a nonprofit organization that helps defendants who may be wrongfully convicted. Dave Pam, good morning to you. Well, these newest attorneys for Scott Peterson come from the L.A. Innocence Project. They say they are looking to poke holes in the convictions of Scott Peterson, who was, of course, convicted of killing his wife and their unborn child more than 20 years ago. Following a five-month trial in 2004, Scott Peterson was convicted by a California jury of the murder of his 27-year-old pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. Despite subsequent unsuccessful appeals, Peterson's death penalty was replaced with a life sentence without parole. However, a recent appeal led by the Los Angeles Innocence Project contends that previously untested DNA evidence could potentially implicate another suspect. Prosecutors vehemently oppose this appeal, citing a plethora of evidence supporting Peterson's conviction detailed in a comprehensive 337-page court filing. They emphasize Peterson's deceitful behavior, including lies to authorities and his mistress, Amber Fry, as well as suspicious actions surrounding Lacey's disappearance, notably a boat trip on San Francisco Bay, evidence such as Lacey sent at a Berkeley boat ramp and her hair found on pliers from Peterson's boat further incriminate him. The autopsy findings indicated that Lacey Peterson's remains may have been weighted down to the sea floor before being discovered. Prosecutors bolstered this claim with evidence suggesting that Scott Peterson had crafted several makeshift anchors using concrete and rebar. Upon returning from the Berkeley Marina, where it's speculated he disposed of his wife's remains, 
Peterson arrived home in Modesto to find the family dog in the backyard, still wearing its leash. He entered through unlocked French doors at the rear of the house, where he proceeded to consume pizza and milk. Prosecutors revealed that police quickly raised doubts about Peterson's account, particularly questioning why he was dressed in light clothing on a cold, overcast day, if he had indeed gone fishing. Peterson claimed he had changed clothes and washed his fishing attire. However, officers discovered discrepancies when they found a full hamper and a pile of damp clothing, including jeans, a blue t-shirt, and a green pullover atop the washing machine. Despite Peterson's insistence on innocence, prosecutors assert that his actions, including purchasing a car under a false identity and contradictory statements to police, provide compelling evidence of guilt. They also challenge Peterson's claims about Lacey's activities before her disappearance, highlighting inconsistencies in his narrative. As the legal battle continues, a hearing on the DNA dispute is scheduled for May 29th. Peterson, maintaining his innocence, remains incarcerated, serving a life sentence for the murders of his wife and son. First of all, describe what the past month has been for you. Oh, it's been absolutely terrible, as it is for everyone. I mean, you see us in press conference. You haven't seen me as much in the media, but you see our families and the raw emotion that's out there and the grief, um, the frustration. You know, we go through a range of emotions from anger to frustration to grief. For me, it's uh, a, uh, it comes at different times during the day. She's the one that we need to find and bring home. I know you have so moments. That gives you focus. It gives you, yeah, yeah. There well, are times yeah. when you just can't continue and you have to, if you're driving, you have to pull over and stop. And if you're doing something, you just uh, can't continue. Lacey's still alive. She's out there and someone's holding her. And these are critical days that we have left until the due date of February 16th. And we just need all of your help.